Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you from these United States of America, here in the middle of the country, good old Iowa. Summer Iowa. Summer Iowa. Finally Very summer, summer Iowa. summery this week. I don't want to get anyone who happens to listen any further south mad at us, because, Bud, let's admit, we've had, like, the oh, yeah. best summer. <laughs> I think I did. I think I did four or five backyard fires during July. So just saying that has to like enrage someone from like San Marcos, Texas. If they're we, listening, we had some autumnal evenings here in July. I mean, it was it was wonderful. But to be fair, everyone, we're getting some summer. Um, I know you don't want to hear us complain, so I won't complain. But bud, very summer, Iowa. It's nice to have you with us listening here on Iowa Catholic Radio. This is the Uncommon Good. I am Bo Bonner, uh, senior advisor for Mission Initiatives. And uh, the director for the Center for Human Flourishing here at Mercy College. Bud, what do you do at the old college? I'm an academic dean at the college. I specifically oversee liberal arts and sciences, so I consider those important fields. He's uh, bringing the heat all the time, even winter. No, I'm joking. Reading, uh, writing, arithmetic, science. No, it's well, the great thing about summer at Mercy is our doors aren't shuttered. Some colleges will appear as ghost towns this time of year. But not us. There's still some hustle and bustle on campus. We certainly, we certainly have quite a few people. And I mean, we of course, uh, you're listening now. We we had rag by rag bry roll through. Although they didn't go by campus or stay on campus or anything like that. Yeah. Weirdly, camping out at uh, Waterworks Park. Uh, so you know, if you're a Southsider, I'm sure that you you know <laughs> were pointing and saying tisk tisk. The Southsiders don't like being uh, bothered. But no, I you know, um, but I've never done rag bry. Uh, there was peer pressure at work trying to get me to do uh-huh. rag bry, but uh, I was getting ready to, you know, go on um, a, a travel, so I decided not to. But uh, I don't know if biking is for either you or me on a rag bry level. What would you say? No, you've got to choose your. I was going to say battles, but um, adventures wisely. Uh, even in at my own household, I've kind of scaled back on some physical activities that I'll do. So. Um, these days I'm playing wolf ball with the boys and I'm all time pitcher, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I do, you were going to be like, you know, I'm not going to do athletic stuff like <laughs> clean the house. <laughs> oh. No, uh, in terms of the athletic side of things, I try to take an evening walk with Rachel and do some, um, driveway basketball. Nice. But I've retired from softball. <laughs> Dude, the softball, the, like, yeah, when I started to finally feel old yeah. was people would hit the ball and I'd take off to the next base and pull a hamstring. So that was very humiliating. Well, we had a softball team here in Des Moines one summer that we kicked off, and it was very humiliating. <laughs> I'll say humbling. It was good for my spiritual life. I missed a game. Who was it that, uh, well, I don't know if we should name people on air. I was going to say stumbled into home plate. Oh, yeah. Like, supposedly there was a game where we were actually, it was competitive. Yeah. And uh, we're going in for like the tying score, and the it, person shall remain nameless. And but yes, poorly. it was yeah, it was it was appropriately humbling, like you said. Yeah. You know what else is humbling, Bud? We need to do this full. We need to go mystery science theater on one of our old episodes. Oh yeah, but I was listening to like the very first ones because I realized that we did intros a little different. Yeah, um, I sound a bit different. Bud, you sounded like a, a chipper young man back oh, then. Oh, man. <laughs> like my, I, my age is showing up even over the airwaves. Yeah, but I think in a good way. Like, you sound wiser. I'm not saying Yoda. or not even old man Obi-Wan Kenobi. Maybe like Obi-Wan Kenobi episode three, before it all went bad. You know, different than episode one. Listen to the uncommon good you should. <laughs> what are we talking about today on the show? Speaking of wisdom... Uh, the big one, bud. Book eight on our radio reading roundup, The Confessions of St. Augustine. Book eight is when the big guy converts. And uh, getting to talk to you about this is we want to thank Mercy College of Health Sciences for making this possible, mchs.edu. In many ways, bud, I think this is the chapter people have been waiting for. So it's, it's going to be easy. Uh, the hour is going to breeze by talking about chapter eight. 
Yeah, it's a famous book, but certainly a famous section. Some really standout moments in Augustine's life covered here. And you know me, I have some shots fired out of the gate that I cannot wait to get to. Um, mostly about, like, uh, I think we, we can talk about, because you read the Confessions at Protestant Seminary too, right? We were in the same class, or did you read it for anything? Uh, I know I read the Confessions at St. Louis University. I don't remember it at. Did we read it in our intro to uh, church history? I think so, but we'll bring yeah. up Protestant readings too. This is the Uncommon Good. Bobon and Dr. Budmar, stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Whether you're listening live over air on Iowa Catholic Radio, dot, uh, well, on, on air, uh, through our radio stations, online, iowacatholicradio.com, Iowa Catholic Radio app, or all of our wonderful listeners on the podcast, thank you for tuning in. Bud, it is our, we're back on track with Radio Reading Roundup. I know we had um, a bit of a break. So book eight, the big one, the conversion one. So here at the break, as we're waiting to come back on air, um, Bud and I were sorting out that we did, in fact, read this in a Protestant setting. Mm -hmm. And so, Bud, obviously, let's just hit some big ones that happen. Augustine really sort of, when he focuses in, on what made him convert. There's this famous scene where he's basically writhing in pain by a garden, and then he hears a kid yeah. say, tole lege, take up and read. He reads uh, St. Paul, and famously, that's when it sort of, he all converts. He then talks to his buddy. He goes, tells his mom, he's converted. Now, but for you, I'll, I'll, I'll say very quickly what I remember, but for you, do you remember <laughs> any certain marks of how, Book eight is understood in a Protestant context. Ooh, I don't know if I get the direction you're headed. So what I yeah. saw is they're like, look, he read the Bible and he was converted. Oh, I see. And so a lot yeah. of this starts to be backfilling that, okay, you know, you just give someone a Bible. Eventually they'll, they'll be yeah. convicted enough. And then it's that take and read. It seems to me that book eight is condensed to that scene but that scene for me, if you read all of Book 8, is dripping with examples of the saints. And it's actually the saints oh. that convert uh, St. Augustine. But let's dwell on the Protestant stuff a bit more. Have I jogged your mind enough back to go back in that time in your life and think about what Augustine, the Confessions, in Book 8, how that was narrated in Protestant circles. Because let me tell people who are listening on air, I don't want to like drive this too much, but I, I think this is very illustrative about sometimes why we get misreadings of Augustine. This book would oftentimes be the last book of the sort of Middle Ages or late antiquity that you would read until maybe Thomas Aquinas, but then you get in the Reformation after that. And so if you read the Confessions and the next thing you're reading is like Calvin or Luther, it's a very different reading about what's going on yep. here. Well, it's it's ironic that that's kind of sometimes the way it's presented by Protestants because there's a famous quote from Augustine where he said, I would not have been convinced by the Gospels, or I would not have been converted by the Gospel if I had not been convinced by the authority of the Church. And in the context of that excerpt, he talks about how, like, you can't make sense of Scripture without the Church canonizing it, you know, transmitting it. But I do have to say, you know, and I spent a long time, so I had seven, like almost 14 total years of theological education. Sorry, honey, for having to take that long. <laughs> but the first the first seven were in a Protestant context, and they do love Augustine. Mm -hmm. I am part of it. Like many Calvinists, he does, when he argues with the Pelagians, there's a way that you can read his writings where, like, it, it does lean, like, in a double predestination direction. He's got a strong sort of notion of the sovereignty of God. Of course, of course, Catholics do as well. But all of those things get sort of um, funneled into like kind of a Protestant understanding of those doctrines. And then there's this idea. I've, I've never quite seen this one, but you will find Protestants who kind of act like later what they would call Catholic accretions are sort of muted in Augustine. Mm -hmm. But in my perspective, that's only the case because he wrote so much. Yes. But there are passages in there that are really difficult to reconcile with, like, mainstream Protestant theology. So we talked about this a couple episodes ago, 
But Monica says like when I die, um, I don't, I don't really care so much that you spend an exorbitant amount of money on my funeral. Like the, um, the accretions of the funeral or like the whatever, like pomp and circumstance. That's not the right term, but like right. that, you, that, that, that he would spend a lot on her funeral. She says like, but I want you every day to remember me at the altar. Mm-hmm. Um, he he definitely has a sacrificial understanding of the mass. So praying for the dead, you know, I don't know. No, obviously I think you're right about all this. What I want to strike at is the heart of the sort of Protestant narrative of his conversion, which is, this kid singing a song that Augustine admits he never heard, but take and read. Take, he's making it sound like it's like a child's, like, you know. Yeah, and song. I've heard different theories as to what was going on there. There probably wasn't a popular song that had those no. words. He's hallucinating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excuse me. No. Uh, but, I mean, he even admits, he's like, I don't know, it was weird. So it was so weird that it caught his mind. And so then he famously <laughs> takes up and read, and he reads, uh, so not in dissipation and drunkenness, nor in debauchery and lewdness nor in arguing and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or the gratification of your desires. Now, some interesting things just about this, bud. So this idea is like Augustine finally read the Bible. He got rid of all of that Cicero junk. He got rid of all of these things holding him up. He got to good Bible learning and he converted. First of all, that has to be like not the passage you should try to lead with uh, when it comes to... uh, apologetic well maybe not but like evangelical efforts it's so very weird it's just about like you know don't do these things now but if we recall what he said he's been struggling with it's not intellectually and actually not even jesus at this point completely right he's admitted that he has this deep divide in the will because he wants to be a christian but like he realizes that his he still wants to do all these other things and because of his philosophical journey that was what was holding him back because he's like, well, but like, why do I want these things, etc.? Why is this important, bud? Because he already knows all this. See, people have, if you're reading this idea that like what Augustine does, is he took the Bible and he read and he learned something he didn't know and he decided to convert. This makes no sense. He's just spent at least two chapters saying he at the time knew all that stuff was wrong. Mm-hmm. So, bud, you tell me, th- think about this. Act like you're the listener on the radio here reading along <laughs> with us. Why is it important that he took up a book and read it silently and it made him think, ah, God is directly talking to me right now, and if he's telling me this through Scripture, I should do it. There's two very important people that this is an imitation of. Well, the first is Ambrose, right? Like his mentor in the faith? Yeah. Because he had seen Ambrose do this activity himself. Absolutely. So, like, we get – so I'm sorry for being the narrative literature dork – but he sets this up big time that reading silently is weird and that, okay, he heard the kid, but then he reads. And I think the word even says, I begin, like that he, he began to read silently, right? So where does he go? Yeah, he says, I read in silence. Yeah, so he reads in silence. So it's St. Ambrose, right? It's actually a living saint among him, imitating him that has brought him to this point. But who's the second saint, this guy not alive at the time? Yeah. that really made him go, this is the thing I should do. Well, in this very passage, I'm not sure this is what you're referring to, but when he hears the ch- the children's song, he said his mind went to St. Antony, the great Absolutely. desert monastic, and he said he recalled an, uh, an account from Antony's life where he had heard the gospel and seen it or had heard it directly addressed to him. Absolutely. I was struck so so singularly this time that it was... Anthony and the story of the saint in which I mean, but the narrative book eight is crazy. Cause at one point he's like three levels of remove deep. He's like this one guy who became a saint who talked to these two kids who had become saints. They heard and picked up and read. I mean, yeah. it was like inception, but with like saint stories. And at the root of this is St. Anthony's famous, the life of St. Anthony that yeah. is well known by that time where he's struggling about what he should do and he goes and he hears the word proclaimed, not read you know, himself, but word proclaimed, go and sell all that you have and follow me. And so St. Anthony becomes the father of uh, ascetic hermit monks because that's what he does. He immediately yeah. sells all that he does and goes out into the wilderness. And Augustine is reporting in book eight, essentially like four or five different individuals, bud, that have become saints because of St. Anthony, and he's including himself in that list. So 
it's the scriptures, of course, but the scriptures speak, A, because Christ is speaking to him. It's not information from the Bible. It's like, mm-hmm. I know you want to tell me something, Lord, and he does through St. Paul's scripture passage. It goes, hey, don't worry about all this because you're going to put on Christ. But he does this because he's imitating St. Anthony. And so this book eight is suffused with the stories of saints. It is thick with the stories of saints. And it's he even runs and goes, tells a future saint and his mom, St. Monica. Yeah. But what converts St. Converts Augustine is the saints. The Protestants are wrong. Okay. Mm. And I th- was struck by this because I, I have, like you said, yeah. read along or heard people talk about Augustine in his central place multiple times. And I just think they have a sort of almost modern evangelical take on what he's doing here. Yeah, you get the sense from some of them that it was almost like a Gideon Bible type moment. Like he turned over at his bed at a hotel and in the uh, dresser drawer there was um, there was a Gideon Bible there. But like I think Augustine's a great example of the fact that like the scripture doesn't make sense sort of like isolated from that context of the church and the lives of the saints. In fact, kind of to your point, I've read this book a few times, but when I came across his conversion this time around, I had to go back and read that those first few sentences because for a moment I thought he was saying that he picked up a book about St. Anthony. Right. But he was he was calling to mind something that he had already read about his life. Yeah, no, I mean, so like earlier we have all those people that, like, so because book eight is actually pretty long, to be honest, and it really seems like we're not going to get to the conversion scene because he's talking about all these people, and we can pick that up in a bit. And then he goes on a, a tirade about like how the will can be against itself, which is yeah. very important to him. Um, but you're right. He sort of jogs your memory right before the big moment. He goes, um, I could not recall ever having heard. Uh, so he goes, I stemmed the flood of tears and rose to my feet. This after he heard the kid, yeah. believing that this could be nothing other than a divine command to open the book and read the first pas- passage I chanced upon. Usually people stop there. See, Gideon Bible moment. <laughs> But what? For I had heard the story of how Anthony had been instructed by a gospel text. And so he happened to arrive at the gospels being read and took the words to be addressed to himself, go and sell the poor. So he was promptly converted to you by this plainly divine message. Stung into action, I returned to the place where Olypius was sitting down, and then he did that. And it's interesting, right, because he then speaks to Olypius. Olypius is like, what's going on? And he goes, I closed the book marking the place with a finger between the leaves, um, or by some other means. I love that he's like, I don't remember. Uh, told Olympus what happened. My face was peaceful now. He, in return, told me what he had happening to him. And so he read, and then the next part goes, make room for the person who is weak in faith. And re- he referred this text to himself and interpreted it to me. Yeah. So it's like two birds, one gospel stone, all in imitation of St. Anthony. And again, I think this makes you read everything you you think about the confessions different so he's been of course quoting scripture he's been praying this whole time but this has really been about the long way in which the saints both current and alive ambrose and monica but also those in the past and the recent past that they have guided they've been god's hand guiding augustine this entire time well to kind of continue with that theme uh i don't want to get into like a simplistic like faith works divide because that would be importing later controversies to Augustine. But when I reread this, this book eight again, it reminded me of the passage in James where he says like, we're saved not by faith alone, but by faith active through works and whatnot. And he says like, even the demons believe in God and shudder, but they're of course like not saved. Now in fairness, there are a lot of Protestants who will say like a saving faith is active trust in God. And I know like there are nuances there, but it's fascinating that for Augustine, his final conversion is an act of the will. So he starts book eight by saying, like, he says, he has this beautiful phrase that he was besieged mm. on every side by God. And so he says, like, mentally, I was all the way there. Concerning your eternal life, I was now quite certain, though I had glimpsed but a tantalizing reflection in a mirror. And so it's like, intellectually, he had already drawn conclusions about the world that were like with the grain of Christianity, but he was still clinging to sin in his life and unable to sort of like bring his will all the way there. No, that's absolutely because yeah. Wh- I, and I think in some ways maybe we can save it for um, segment two to get really deep in this, like the slavery of habit and like yeah. the division of the mind. But I'm with you that like, again, 
if you're going to try to enlist Augustine on your side of the debate for like fights that we're having later on in Christianity, you just have really difficult, problematic points where, I mean, so I guess what they would say about is like, what are you going to do about like Augustine where he clearly seems like he's double predestination or things like this. And I think it's easy to go, look, Augustine wrote a lot. We weirdly have a lot of his stuff and he lived for a long age. And so I think we can say sometimes he let the particularities of an argument carry him too far. His confessions weirdly shows that he's sort of that type of guy too, right? Like he long after he didn't think astrology worked, he was like, but why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? Um, But I think if you're trying to enlist Augustine as the guy who's like, works play no part at all like that sort of idea you have a weird you have a lot of work to do his accounting for like in his confessions why he thought he ended up where he did well you know i think luther tried to harness him for his arguments about the bondage of the will and luther goes all the way and basically says like we we don't have free will so he he argues against that i think on the question of freedom as i understand it and i can't pretend to be like a full-fledged Augustine scholar, but like his writings on Pelagianism do have a different sort of tenor than other parts of his writings. You know, I do think his retractiones are very Catholic. Like when you look at, at the end of his life, he had the privilege, which none of us will probably ever write as much as Augustine did, but you know, God granted him this period where he could like look back and say like, yeah, I know I wrote this and I wrote this and here's, you know, like here's where I settled or whatnot. But, um, this, yeah, even on that question, like freedom of the will, It's funny because one of Luther's charges is that like there's the purity of the gospel and then later Catholic theology became corrupted by the infusion of too much philosophy. Well, Augustine, Augustine is chock full of philosophy. I mean, he's drawing on Plato, he's drawing on Cicero. So it's not like even with Augustine that you have this kind of stage where it's like pre whatever. No, and I think this is interesting to like combine the, 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 this point with the earlier one, um, the first saint that we get Augustine going into is the saint who actually uh, translated Plato. Yeah. So, you know, he, this is the, by the way, Augustine's name is really easy to say. All of his friends are much harder to say. So, um, Olympias. Yeah. Well, no. So this is uh, simply Simplicianus and Victorinus. So he goes and says, look, I went and talked to, um, I love that. Like, the guy whose name means simplicity, his name is hard for me to say, but he went to Simpli- uh, uh, Sim- Simplicianus and he told him the story of Victorinus. And the reason he did this, because he was the pagan who had translated um, the platonic te- the Neoplatonic texts that um, Augustine was, was reading. And so then this is a, an interesting, a little bit of a winding story. It's funny how in the middle of his own story of his life, he really takes time to, to jazz up the narrative elements of this guy's life. But he goes for a while, he was basically telling Simplicianus like, Oh yeah, I'm basically a Christian. And he goes like, well, I'm not going to believe it until you end up at church. And this again, like I think about Protestants who were like, it's a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. And he got the, so, uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, let me get the right person. Victorinus is like, Oh, so a building is what makes a church. It's hilarious to know that (laughs) people have the same dumb arguments across the centuries. (laughs) Oh, it's a a building that makes the church. And Simplicianus is like, look, man, you can say what you want, but if you're not willing to sort of put your life on the line, yeah. why should I believe you? And then what does he do? He does all that. He not only becomes Catholic and becomes, you know, he like confesses his Christianity, yeah. but he, they offered him to do it more quietly so he could maybe stay, you know, have some of his prestige as an academic kept. But he did it like in front of everyone and was willing to ruin his, his very illustrious career. And, uh, it's funny because Augustine even spends time saying like, why do we care so much when people of high regard convert? And he goes, if it's just because they're rich, we're wrong. But I think what people says, Augustine realize is this guy had spent all of his life trying to get that sort of prestige and he deserved it for his sort of intellectual um, pursuits, but he was willing to lay that all on the line to become Christian. Well, this whole conversation actually brings to mind for me like a broader point and that's this actually came up in a text thread that we're a part of but there's no there's no like cutoff point where you can say like oh beyond here like christianity is authentic and genuine but like we're stopping at saint augustine or at saint thomas or 
at the Reformation, whatever like line people want to draw. Right. And this even comes up with so like you and I are not as big of fans of what's called like the Nouvelle Theology, like some of these great 20th century writers and theologians. But it's not like we don't have to look at them and say like, well, you know, like they're wrong and and Thomas got it all right. Like right. in each age, you see this with Augustine. They're willing to like step into the gladiator ring and have these fights and have these arguments and wrestle with like the going philosophy of the day. But the search for like we just, we were wrong headed if we have this kind of what Pius the Twelfth card called archaeologism. Yeah, like there's this stage where we can go back to and say like, well, these guys got it all right, and we don't need anything post. 1517. No, and it's really interesting, like you said. I mean, we're coming up on the break for the for this first segment, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting that that's who he starts off this litany of conversions with, and it's connecting back to just what happened in book seven, but he goes, hey, the guy who, who helped you out because you read these Neoplatonism texts, he became a Christian, yeah. and hey, Augustine, you know this sort of like hesitancy you have about like throwing your whole life away if you do this? Man, this guy, I mean, at the time, he's way cooler than you are, and he, he threw his hat in the ring. That starts this cascade of other tales of the saints. And so when we get back, uh, that's what we'll talk about. Again, I just want to throw out that. I know, shots fired, bud. But uh, who converted uh, Augustine? And it was the stories of the saints. Uh, just amazing to think about that. That, that yeah. is the driving engine of Book 8. This is The Uncommon Good, Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Be it on the airwaves. Be it on the internet on iowacatholicradio.com. Be it on a device with the Iowa Catholic Radio app or, of course, the good podcast listeners thank you for listening to the show but we are listening to the most famous of all books of saint augustine book eight where he confer uh converts uh the child says take up and read yeah. he reads the bible boom he converts now we have been uh kicking up dust uh for the sake of catholic arguments about this that it really is the story of the saints in book eight that really interconnect to make this moment make sense in imitation of saint anthony who similarly was called by god directly through the medium of a text of the gospel he heard um saint augustine is convinced that something like that is happening and he hears this verse from saint paul which as we've said is not like i don't know it doesn't seem as radical as saint anthony's like sell all that you have and follow me but it's like look augustine this divided will you have and i mean i think that's the heart of this right but is What's being, t what, what's being spoken of in this verse, not in dissipation and drunkenness, nor in debauchery and lewdness, nor in arguing and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or the gratification of your desires. What's being said here, right, is it's that Jesus is speaking directly to Augustine's worries. Yeah. And the worry that he has talked about earlier, and he, he sandwiches this between two sort of, like I said, cycles of talking about saints. We talked earlier about how uh, Simplicianus was talking to Victorina about Victorinus and how he um, made and he he was he was reticent of converting. Hey, I don't need to be. It's just a building. Why do I need to go to the church? But that's because he wasn't willing to give up everything. But the act of the will necessary to be all in on Christ. Augustine then gets into the divided will, which we can talk about a little bit. But then we have another saint story, right? Where it's these two young men who, like, they feel convicted, but they don't know what to do. But then they read about St. Anthony, and they're like, look, St. Anthony, he was sitting around worried. Boom. God speaks to him. Decisive act of the will. They're going to do the same thing. Yeah. A narrative masterpiece from someone that we've been talking about, how he's just a rhetorician par excellence, but often gets sidelined, bud. So this idea of the divided will. It's interesting that for Augustine, he thinks the problem's been intellectual, but the entire time he keeps throwing out, well, here's this aspect of the will, here's this aspect of the will. We even talked last time we spoke on book seven that he's sort of the new, like the old, the, the, a better version of the Cartesian. It's, I, not, it's not I think, therefore I am. It's I desire, therefore I am. Yeah. And this gets at the heart of it, bud, is if we can want something but not yet want it fully, and that is what Augustine has found himself, the quicksand he's found himself in. 
I actually found this entire book very reassuring to read again. I think many of our listeners would as well, because I think for a lot of persons, even though sometimes apologists or like evangelists will present Christianity as like an intellectual question. And there, there is that there's, there's space for that sort of thing. And there are people who the intellectual objections are kind of front and center but for a lot of persons, even those of us who grew up in the faith and then had to later revert or whatever, it, it is like um, the burden of sin or a final act of the will that we have to make. So when Augustine was speaking here, it really resonated with my own experience, you know, where he describes like the narrowness of the path as very daunting. Right, right, right. And even like, you know, as someone who came into the faith later in life, like going to confession for the first time can be sort of daunting in its own way. But, like, some writers have pointed out, like, our sins always seem much more, like, glamorous or grave in our own eyes. Like, priests in the confessional are are very rarely, like, so to speak, impressed by them. And the the passage that comes to mind from Augustine that I was thinking about there is where he talks about, like, he was almost like in a slumber. Like, it's like the world and its pleasures can create this kind of burden that's similar to sleepiness, and he had to be roused. Um C.S. Lewis makes a similar point point about this with regard to lust. So, like, in our day and age, I think it's fair to say if you talk about, like, so set aside, like, murder and extortion and things like, things Just, like yeah. <laughs> the, the big dogs, that yeah. they'll, the ones they'll make movies about you. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's great. But I think we tend to approach, like, sins of the flesh is the most grave. And, and C.S. Lewis says, you know, like, uh, in some ways, like, it's not the most grave, but they can be the most habitual and in his book, The Great Divorce, he has this image of a guy and the way that Lewis portrays like how some ways like we can think of our our sins of the flesh as like like greater than they actually are in some sense. He portrays this little like lizard that's resting on a guy's shoulder, but like the guy doesn't want that to be destroyed. Like he won't he won't make the rest of the journey if he can't cling to that pet that he's created. And you see that with Augustine it all ties into like you were talking about like Victorinus and how he gave up like the prestige of the world. One of my favorite quotes during the break, I was looking for this, but it's from Benedict the 16th. And he talks about like with our faith, like what we seek is not a set of propositions. We do assent to propositions in our faith, but he says like, God has a faith, uh, excuse me. God has a face. Like we're seeking a person, but he says, are we not perhaps all afraid in some way? If we let Christ enter fully into our lives, if we open ourselves totally to him, are we not afraid that he might take something away from us? Are we not perhaps afraid to give up something significant, something unique, something that makes life so beautiful? Do we not then risk ending up diminished and deprived of our freedom? And then he transitions, Benedict says, no, if we let Christ into our lives, we lose nothing, absolutely nothing of what makes life free, beautiful, and great. No, only in this friendship, are the doors of life opened wide? Only in this friendship is the great potential of human existence truly revealed. And I think that's the recognition that Augustine came to, that to follow God, he wouldn't lose anything in the process. That life actually became fuller and wider by him turning over his will to the one who had created him. No, I think that's a very salient point, bud. And what it makes me think of is, because when... I mean, look, this one seems counterintuitive to hear coming from me because I love talking about the intellect. I love defending the importance of philosophy and theology. And Augustine obviously does too. So it's weird to hear us go like, but the will is ultimately what matters. So again, not to like drag in too many other arguments, but, but Thomas Aquinas actually spends quite a bit of time making this point that, look, yes, the will is what makes something move, but the intellect has to comprehend like an object that the will would want, or otherwise you're not going to move towards anything. So on one hand, Augustine goes like, it comes down to the will, but part of what has left his will incapable of willing is he has to clear intellectual difficulties, but before he even realizes his will's the problem. So the two big ones that become apparent We've talked about the first one. It took him forever to wrap his mind around that God is not some sort of thing or substance like everything else. He really, even when he thought God was invisible, right, he still thought he must be some sort of weird body. And when he realized that, like, no, God is spirit and really imbibed that, man, that cleared away a lot of the things that were going on. Um, But this one, this last Manichaean holdout, he goes, the problem is, 
I understand where the Manichaeans are coming from, right? Because what you want to say is like, oh, I'm not the problem. I have these two warring factions in me. But it's really hard. I mean, it's, it's humiliating to yeah. say what the problem is is actually I have a lot of desires and I don't have control of them. So the Manichaeans decide, well, what you have is a good, a good will and a bad will. And so everything goes from that. But the dualism of like a part of me is perfect and good, but it's being trounced and like there's a bully that is like the craven Gnostic one that's like, you know, stop hitting yourself with the good part of you. And actually, it came from somewhere else. It came from a bad demiurge god or something like this. Yeah. And he goes, no, the fact of the matter is the mind is rent apart by a plethora of desirable objects and even more do battle among themselves. But it's not like the mannequins claim where there's two substances. So he goes like, look, true impulses are like this. And this is where the evil part comes into. Evil is a big one. Is he goes, what happens is not like you have a good and an evil thing and it's warring. He goes, you can have as many fractional desires as you want and if you don't have either the faith to help you out or like you know this grace that he'll get into of course in his career big time but if you don't even have like an intellectual grounding you're not going to know how to like straighten all of these desires out so it's a lot less like two warring factions and more like your soul uh is is an old team that's pulling a carriage but imagine it has like 12 horses and they're all trying to go in the the opposite directions how are you going to have a, a, a life that's not dysfunctional and torn apart in this way? That revelation, it is intellectual, but he starts to realize, oh, this is the problem. I have to understand the way in which my will is trying to rip myself apart, and what am I going to do to bring it back together? And then that Benedict Sixteenth quote that you just said, yeah. I think, is the salient point, is... The reason that I'm not getting all of my horses all in a row is I'm, a, I'm worried, right, that if I fundamentally have to trust in God and put all of my horses in one direction, I might lose out on something. Yeah. But, of course, eternity is the fullness that is the only thing worth hitching all of our will, like, our, our, like I should say, hitching the will to all of these desires in one direction. Well, this is a really salient point, and this is something that we've talked about with our students at Mercy College, but when we talk about things like freedom, sometimes what leads us astray in the modern world is that we use freedom in one sense and we assume someone like St. Augustine is using it in the same sense as we do. So if you poll a lot of young Americans, freedom in our context, most people think of it as to have available to you many options. So, you know, you go through the grocery store and there's like 40 different brands of cereal and so like you're, you're so to speak like more free because you have all these different options or like I steer the direction of my life for Augustine, he doesn't see sin as, you know, like the option of choosing something that's objectively wrong as making you more free. There's really simple ways to think about this. Like if you think of someone who's addicted to something like who they, they've practiced intemperance to the point that they're functionally like an alcoholic they're not free. Like they actually can't live life without making that choice. Or if they end up in a drunken stupor, like their freedom has been incapacitated in a sense. That's kind of, it's kind of easy to like pick on that sort of thing. But even with things that like are very good, like say a relationship, um, we're not more free by clinging to it. Like in a, um, possessive sort of way, like true freedom between a husband and wife or best friends is actually giving someone like the space to, live and pursue like their own dreams and their own like human flourishing. But as human beings, like we tend to want to cling to sins in such a way that our life is narrowed. And that's where for Augustine, like to be free is to be able to know and choose the good. You can kind of think of this by way of analogy with like sports. Like we think of someone as like Michael Jordan, because we've seen all the highlight dunks, like the three sixties and the what's like the cradling, the like rocking the cradle or whatever it happens to be. So we think like Augustine is is actually like this jazz musician where he's just like making stuff up go as he goes along, and that's not even like fair to jazz. But like, what made um, Michael Jordan such a virtuoso is that he actually perfected the basics. So, like as he as he handled the ball or took a three point shot, he had the muscle memory where like amazing things happen naturally, and so he could so to speak like riff on the basics in a way that was amazing because his will was free to do so. I love that. I did think for a second that was like you talking about clinging to like friendships. I was like, oh my gosh, Bud's leaving the show. This is like the longest 
use of Augusta. No, I'm kidding. Um, but- I, it's time for you to be free. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually taking over this show and kicking you out of the that's nest. Right. You got to go on your own. That's great. Well, so <laughs> that's funny. The, uh, the quote that I like to get you to your point is he goes, uh, the frivolity of frivolous f- aims, the futility of futile pursuits. These things had been my cronies of long standing, still held me back plucking softly at my garment of flesh and murmuring in my ear, do you mean to get rid of us? What a great way to put yeah. that, right? Is, you know, I've long said that people get this idea that Augustine is just this harsh, mean dude who thinks everyone in the world is just evil and craven and decrepit. But if you read the confessions, at least, it's mostly that we're frivolous and pathetic. Is He's yeah. like... Because, you know, maybe he's mean to impute that on other people. I think people blow it out of proportion. But certainly with him, you start to realize that he was like, what was I doing all this time? Yeah. Um, the, the sort of uh, thing where you get, uh, uh, you, you get um, someone like, uh, why well, I'm blanking on this very easy one. Oh, like on the, 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 the road to Emmaus where they're like, what, where our heart's not burning within us. Um, you get here with Augustine, he goes, how could we have just spent all this time not hitching our, our, our horses to this great, you know, destination, which is heaven. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Right. Is like, you have those cronies being like, but not yet, but not yet. And this is where you would get one of his other famous quotes from book eight, which is how he describes himself as like, give me chastity, but not yet. Oh Lord. Yeah. Well, in that same section or like right afterwards, what do you make of his, I'm sure as a trained philosopher, you've thought about this before, but I know as Catholics, we say like there's concupiscence. So even though baptism washes away the stain of original sin and restores this kind of freedom to us, that sin exercises this like gravitational pull. It's not sin itself. Like we don't have to go to confession and confess like the way of concupiscence on our lives. But Augustine makes this interesting point. It sort of puzzles him how our mind can make our body move immediately. So I think to myself, like wiggle my fingers and it happens like right then and there, but he says, why doesn't the soul obey the soul? Like what's, what did the philosophers say? Well, I mean, I can't, I see, it seems harder. That's right. I don't know if I can give like an encyclopedic description of all the philosophers, but certainly it's interesting where you start to think, further developments of both Augustinians and then, you know, Thomas and things like this. If you talk about an appetitive will, right? So you think about the fact of, on, on two regards, on one hand, why is it that, like, I'm converted? Why do I not stop immediately doing what I've always done? And you're like, well, this is sort of how habit works, is like the appetitive aspect of the will. It gets used to, even in a biological way, right? If you do something biologically for long enough, your body gets in the habit of doing it. So it's not enough just to say, I renounce that, there's also sort of, it's, you know, it's like a, a boat can't immediately make a turn in the water. It has to sort of uh, make the wide turn because there's also the motion of the lake, things like that. But to the earlier question that the philosophical one, why is it that like my hand has to obey, but my soul doesn't? Well, that's because your soul, of course, has competing reasons and your arm doesn't. Like, so I know when your arm won't work. Like the only no your arm tells your will is like, oh, the muscles are detached, moron, so I can't move. Yeah. So the only, as it were, uh, argument uh, of, of any way that your body can put up against your will is physical injury. So there's no mind to it. Mm. But your soul, right, your soul fighting against the soul, or the intellect versus the intellect, or even the, the spiritual will versus the spiritual will, it has, so to speak, arguments behind it. Um, they're not necessarily as good. So, you know, it's not like you're a computer and it's like measuring which decision is better, right? I mean, hmm. y- you have competing interests. And so this is why we can sort of play devil's advocate against ourselves, which is the interesting aspect about the inner life, bud, that we can actually hold Congress yeah. within our, in ourselves and, and have a, a disputation within ourselves. And that's because I, that would be my immediate answer is your body um, is not the philosopher. Your, yeah. your, your, your hand doesn't have an argument against what your will is doing, but your soul does. Well, on a lighter point, <laughs> <laughs> I know we're coming up against the break. I was happy for Monica at the end of book eight. I know. Because he had talked about all the tears that she had shed. 
he goes in and tells Olympias, his good friend, you know, and then they go in there together and he says, you know, like she's overjoyed. Many years earlier, you had shown her a vision of me standing on the rule of faith and even says like my conversion uh, was a greater gift that I could have given to her even than grandchildren. Yeah. So happy for her. It was. She got to spike the football a a bit, but also we didn't even get into this. Uh, I was rereading a summary and like speaking of like, you know, Protestant seminary and stuff like that. There was a lot of people that, like, it really hurt their feelings that this was Augustine being like, and I knew I could become Catholic because I wouldn't get married. <laughs> and that causes a lot of consternation. I don't think, you, I mean, of course, like, Bud and I both happily married, but I do think this goes to that singleness of will. For Augustine to sort of um, to not be firm on this one is to not make that firm declaration like, you know, Victor Rhinus and at St. Anthony. Yeah. So this is the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars. Stick around. We'll finish up the show right after these messages. Back with the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. We appreciate it so much having all of you be willing to be with us. Bud, Radio Reading Roundup. Book eight, a wonderful book uh, to get to jump back in on. But time to have, you know, you said, like, why is it that the hand does whatever the will does? Yeah. But, like, the souls fight. It's time for two souls to fight here. (laughs) I think we should do the whole book. Yeah. I know a lot of people end after book eight. I don't want to have, like, a wrestling match on air, but what do you say, man? Should we, like, I admit to everyone who's listening, the rest of the book is harder than the other parts. But there is aspects about memory and reading that I love so much, Bud. I think we should take the plunge and do it. Well, <laughs> yeah, we probably should. I'm flipping ahead here, so we've talked a lot about Monica. We should probably definitely do book nine. Look at least. briefly at uh, he he does talk about her death and his own grief. You know, we've been talking about like our Protestant seminary formation, and one. One thing that I experienced at both like my undergraduate and master's degree is that with church history, they go like early church, maybe like Irenaeus, Augustine, uh, Thomas, Boop, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Reformation. And so like, I don't want to be that person who avoids books. When does he really start getting pretty speculative? Book 10? Yeah. But he talks about like, like the entire Bible at yeah. one point, like in Genesis. I think that there's stuff that it's worth navigating the weeds to figure out. So what well, do you actually, say? in some of his stuff on Genesis, I think is really important. What, I, this is reaching back, but in 1999, I wrote a paper on Augustine's view of time. Yes. So I could break out some old JBU research papers. JBU. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Yep, we're doing it. All right, okay. folks, like you heard it first, we're going to do the hard part of the confessions. You guys were thinking you were just getting the chicken nugget version of the confessions, but we are doing it French style. Bud, all of the bones, all of the skin. <laughs> we won't do the chicken feet, but we'll do everything else. How's that? St. Augustine, pray for us. <laughs> well, if, Bud, if people <laughs> want to pray for us as we do this, what are ways they can do so? Joining with everyone else on Iowa Catholic Radio with our prayer life. Yeah, please do join us. We broadcast the Rosary on air every morning, 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. Then the Chapel of Divine Mercy at 2.55 p.m. You can also use the Iowa Catholic Radio app anytime, anywhere to pray the Rosary. And you can go on iowacatholicradio.com to figure out any events that are happening in and around the Diocese of Des Moines, but also the Iowa Catholic Radio listening area. Bud, you know it's that time of year when the Iowa State Fair is getting ready to get hopping. So the next big events for Iowa Catholic Radio all involve that. August 10th, 8 p.m. at the Iowa State uh, Fairgrounds uh, for King and Country with special guest We the Kingdom. And then on August 20th uh, at 8 o'clock at Iowa State Fair, uh, Kane. August 31st at the Jasper Winery. So this is Des Moines at 6 p.m. There is a Mary's Meals concert. And then September 8th, West Des Moines at noon, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, the Man Up West Power Lunch. And then, of course, we got the big old December 8th uh, at 6 p.m. Embassy Suites downtown. Dinner in December with Dr. David Anders. All of those things you can find out on iowacatholicradio.com. Last thing I want to say, bud, is, of course, we cannot have this ministry, and it is a ministry, without you out there in the world helping us out. It's not just the people behind the uh, microphones. 
behind uh, the boards or behind the desks. You make it possible. So please be mindful of our upcoming fall carathon. Uh, well, I don't know if we call it that anymore, but fundraiser. Mm-hmm. But you can get started on that by going to iocatholicradio.com or 515-223-1150 to text or call about donations. Well, bud, I hope people take and listen to this podcast. Uh, well, it's not just a podcast. Yeah. I, if you're listening on air right now, you can take and re-listen to the podcast at any time. We need to figure out this week. Maybe we can talk to our good friend Brian Gonzalez about the Latin for take and listen. So tolo lege. Yeah. It can't be tolo. (laughs) Isn't that a car? (laughs) Our people, people are like, well, we were going to keep listening, but now we're not. (laughs) We're also underwritten by, no, that would be, that'd be too great. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but look folks, I hope you've been enjoying the radio reading roundup. Um, like I said, we got a few more uh, chapters to go with St. Augustine, but Bud, I have felt very privileged and honored to get to do this again. Yeah. It has really been meaningful this Send us around. some recommendations for future books to cover. Absolutely. This is The Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, family, city, state, nation, uh, world, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.